Before we get into today's episode, don't forget to sign up to the book and the VIP newsletter at thehighestandbestuse.com. For the book, you can get that at Amazon Chapters, Barnes & Noble, all of these places in paperback, ebook, hardcover, and of course now the Audible version as well. So grab the book, sign up to the VIP newsletter, thehighestandbestuse.com, and now to today's episode. I'm Stephen Bro. The highest and best use of my business is operating an excavation company. Thanks for tuning into the highest and best use real estate podcast, where we talk techniques to optimize your land structure, skill sets, and time, as well as the highest and best use principles to make your business more profitable, productive, and efficient. I'm your host, Ryan Carr, reminding you that good deals are found, great deals are created, and I'm super excited today. We have Steve Bro on the show. I got to read this guy's bio. So, owner and operator of Bro's Construction, been in business since 2014, self-employed, and in construction for 40 years, and him and his wife own this company, doing 15 million in top line sales, 34 employees. So, man. Thank you for being here. It's been growing, yeah. This is so much fun. Right. I'm glad to have you in the hot seat. Well, well, thanks for inviting me. So you and I have been working together for five years, maybe? Uh, maybe five. pushing eight, I would think, wouldn't it? Uh, no, I don't think it's that long. No? I don't think it's that long, no. but I'll take the Feels credit. Like it. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the construction industry and what it's like to grow an active business in the construction industry, uh, servicing primarily real estate and, and development. Not fun. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it. If you've been doing this yeah. for 40 years, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I, I started working when I got out of high school, obviously, and... Uh, I started with a Hardening King Construction back then, which was a pretty large company. Uh, I started off just as a scale person right out of school, mm -hmm. scaling in trucks. That's when people drive in and, and weigh yeah, the vehicle. weigh their trucks yeah. and you know so on and so forth. And I uh, just moved up the ladder from there, and I ended up being operation manager of there and moved into another company. And I really only had two significant jobs, and then I've been on my own now for eight years. Yeah. Awesome. What do you yeah. prefer? Employed or self -employed? Um, I think now I'm on my own, it's good, uh, but I got to figure out an escape road. I'm not getting any younger. Uh, <laughs> we'll talk exit plan at the end of the show. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to hear I it. Gotta, yeah. I got to figure that out, but um, <laughs> that's, that's a hard thing to do. Uh -huh. uh, but it, it, it seems to be growing sometimes a little out of control. Mm -hmm. But maybe with the market now, it's going to slow down a bit and be more manageable. But, yeah. What did It was Mario Andretti who said something like, if you're not in control, you're not going fast enough. Something, something yeah, to this effect. Yeah, and I thought, yeah. wow, that's pretty poignant. Yeah, yeah. Do you it's, feel the same way? Yeah, yeah. You gotta. That's the thing. You have to be in control. And if it gets too big out of control, it's not. It's, yeah. it's not good. So. Where do you draw the line? Knowing what you know now, coming from an employee, seeing a bunch of things, yeah. right? Going to do your own thing. Like, where do you draw the line to say, you know what? I've been here before. This is a little too crazy. Or we need to grow. Um, I think the last couple of years we've been growing fairly consistent and uh i think right now we're at a, a like we run two full sewer crews mm -hmm. and then we have other uh men to do other type of work which i think is all we need at this point with mm -hmm. what i have yep and i got to be careful with equipment it's hard to buy equipment now you have to order it a year in advance yeah. and there's no more wheeling and dealing uh it's the price and that's it <laughs> this is it take it or leave and it. it you know the prices have gone up you know 30 40 percent you know, so for the folks at home, tell them a little bit about what you do specifically with, re with respect to excavation. Uh, we do sewer, water, mm -hmm. uh, we demolition, road building, a lot of commercial work, commercial buildings. Uh, um, we do some snow removal. We don't get into that whole lot. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we do land clearing. We do walls, uh, armor stone walls, engineered walls, um, all that kind of stuff. We, we try to generally work, we work for the city of Oshawa, Clarington, Whitby. Um, we have a couple big engineering firms that use us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're one of the region, six region contractors for the region of Durham, which was a, a big feather in my hat. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a hard thing to accomplish at the time. We had to go with all of our resumes of our staff on, you know, they, they were pretty picky, but. No, really? They go through all your staff? They go through our staff with what uh, our resumes, all of your experience. You got to be experienced, right? Mm -hmm. They have to make sure you have the right experience on your staff. So don't go yeah. digging up the road unless you know what's up. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're doing. So, and then we do a lot of emergency stuff for the school boards, and yeah, you know, so we we have a mix of everything that, that that's that's what helps us grow mm -hmm. and keep us busy. Also, like I'm happy to say, every winter we barely even have a layoff. We keep all of the guys going. 
Which is a big thing in construction. It, it's huge, yeah. and, but that's because we're so versatile in all different things. So what do you think sets you apart from the next company doing something similar? We do small stuff. I think that's the big thing. Mm. We do small stuff. Like yourself, we, you know, we deal with homeowners. We deal with small contractors. Uh, so I always like to say if there's money cutting grass, we'll cut grass. <laughs> Not that I would, but um, <laughs> I like to say that, you know, if there's money in it, we'll, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. How do you think the real estate market changing the way that it has in the last 12 to 18 months has affected what you do? We haven't been digging many basements, next to none. Um, we, we usually dig, that's not one of our big things, but we usually dig about 60 to 65 a year. And right now it's been pretty slow. Really? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Ah, the cost of, I think the cost of materials, like even just do stuff around our yard or shop or whatever and buying our own lumber, like it's very expensive right sure. now. Do you think the price of diesel has anything to do with that? Oof. Yeah, like our, our we were paying um, less than a dollar rack rate a year ago. Mm-hmm. And a couple months ago, we were up 203. So that's another it's dollar. Double. Yeah, that's Whoa. a dollar a liter more. Jeez. And a dump truck per se takes 250 liters a day mm-hmm. on a low day. So that's another $250 a day. Wow. And then our excavators take 250, 300 liters a day. Mm-hmm. So that's another 250, 300 doors a day. And when you got 15 or 20 of them, and, you know, we have 47 pieces of heavy equipment out there working rock trucks, dozers. Oh my gosh. And they all, you know, the fuel's gone up that much. And it's hard to, we increased our rates somewhat, but it's hard to put that whole amount. That's another 25, 30 dollars an hour. Yeah. Onto the client. True. That's very difficult for anybody that's in the middle of building a house or a commercial building to all of a sudden accept, right? Like mm-hmm. That kind of money. So. Oh, by the way, price of fuel went up and now your cost is going to be that much more. Yeah, yeah. but mm-hmm. And then gravel, the you know, production of gravel, trucking, all mm-hmm. that. Gravel's gone up 30, 40%. Asphalt, everything has. Really? Yeah. Wow. So, so how it's do you kind think of that... scary wondering why, how they can handle building these buildings still. How do yeah. you think that impacts the... I guess the volume of overall activity in the market. Because, I mean, if costs are higher, if you can't justify it, maybe you don't build. Well, the last two years, I've been wondering why we're so busy. I (laughs) I can't understand it. I really can't. And we're still busy. Mm -hmm. And we're still pricing. And I don't don't know why. Uh, It's kind of scary. I'm always... I always hold my cards tight to me, wondering when it's going to slow down, <laughs> and I'm worried about buying the next machine and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But it, it still seems to uh, be going pretty strong. Well, it's always funny. Like sometimes you'll call me and you'll be like, "Hey, what are you seeing in the market right now?" And then yeah. sometimes I'll call you and I'll be like, "Hey, what are you seeing in the yeah, market? What I'm are other worried, people right? doing?" Yeah, I'm worried. I, I don't think I'll be in problems. Right. I just I don't want to get too many machines and, and can't keep them going. Right. For and, sure. Like try not to have many payments, right? That's the because <laughs> you know, the machine's the same price as the house, pretty much. So pretty. Well. Do you think yeah. we'll ever go hybrid? I can't see how. Yeah, but maybe. But yeah. I'll, I'll probably be gone by then. Because <laughs> if I you hope. think, I I don't know the answer, which is why I'm curious to see how you feel about it. Because like these machines are are predicated on weight. Yeah. Like if if you need an excavator, it's got to be heavy. Yeah. Right. And I mean batteries are traditionally heavy. So what better of a location? And like I, it has to keep the horsepower too though true it has to have the horsepower because you're running all your pumps and drives and mm. uh, and you need the horsepower for digging and you know a dozer a dump truck even I, i'll be surprised to see trucks maybe freight haulers that are just going from point a to point b mm-hmm. but uh gravel hauling i don't i, I can't see it but I, I don't know yeah i don't know so in terms of like growing and scaling your business so you started your own diy you yep. came from an employer who was previously doing that. And you're like, you know what? I think I can do this bigger, faster, smarter, better, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Knowing what you know now, looking back of eight years of experience, plus your employment <clears> history <throat> of, well, you're totaling 40. Yeah. Do you think it'd be more advantageous to buy a business or to start it? That's a good question. If you have the capital to buy it, mm-hmm. it might be the best way to go. Um, but you'd have to it'd be a lot of money to buy a business and hope to show profit right away. Right. Like we grew very slowly, uh, like one guy and me and, you know, and we grew that way. And then yeah, we, cause you're like, you were boots on the ground. I, I, you still are. Bought sometimes. A, I bought a rubber <laughs> tire back and bounced around myself for the first year, pretty much. Uh huh. And then got a laborer and another and so on and so forth. And I had, I had good customer base from my, 
previous couple employers and, uh, you know, they started giving me work and uh, mm -hmm. the rest was history, right? So how many people did you start off with? Just you and one person? Me and one person, really. Yeah. And then how did it evolve? It just slowly, we just kept picking up more work and I called Kijiji and stuff like that <laughs> and got who anybody could breathe. I put them to work. <laughs> it, it was hard. It was hard because, um, you know, some of the people you get is not that strong, right? So let's talk staffing. What's that? Let's talk about staffing. Yeah. Finding, finding quality assistance. Very difficult. How come? They're just not out there. If they're out there, they all have a good job. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I think in our industry, we don't steal back and forth traditionally. People try, but really, if you know the other contractors, which we do, mm -hmm. we don't steal from each other. And you're talking excavation specifically? Yeah, excavation. Yeah. yeah. We don't really take back and forth. Mm -hmm. If somebody leaves one of the other places, then maybe, but there's usually a reason they left. So you gotta be careful. But a silent departure. It's, it's better to take the young people and groom them the way you want for the future, I think is, is what we have to do. Cause mm. we're all getting old, right? Yeah. We're all so getting old. What is the cost in doing that? Cause you can find somebody that's really green yep. and say, come on in, like, come on on board. But like now there's the cost of inefficiencies and, and errors and mistakes and you know, all of this, yep. what is the cost of doing that versus buying somebody from somewhere else? Um, I don't know. I've never measured it, but it would, there would be a cost. And the biggest, the biggest thing to worry about is you get that person trained mm -hmm. and somebody gives them another dollar and they leave. <laughs> um, and then they find out it's not, the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. Yeah. Um, we're not a unionized company. Uh, we, we don't want to be, we, we fight it, mm -hmm. fight it off as much as we can. Mm -hmm. I try to give my guys good pay. We have benefits, pension, you know, and we have Christmas parties, bonuses. Like uh, I try to treat yeah. the guys all like a family type thing. So that makes such a difference. Well, the, for the people who want that, they, they're attracted to it. And the other people that want the a quick buck here and there, they bounce from company to company. Right. And mm -hmm. there's got, there's a lot of guys out there like that. So do you think your retention's higher because you're family oriented? I think so. Yeah. yeah we got, I'd like to say we have, probably the best bunch of employees that are on the market out there right now. Where can things go right and wrong with staff? Um, right is a perfect day when I have to drive around and my phone don't ring <laughs> and I wonder what, what's going on. I wonder how come the day is so good. Mm -hmm. And other days you wake up in the morning and you just want to go back to bed and wake up again and try it over because it's just, uh, our, our biggest issue is, is there's a danger aspect digging in the ground where men are in trench boxes and uh, so you got all the underground utilities cave-ins overhead wires traffic mm -hmm. so you have to be very conscious all the time on safety because not only the legalities of it the, we're all friends right yeah like we all know each other on a personal level and you don't want anybody to get hurt so. mm -hmm. does that happen cave-ins you go oh gosh that was close um i've had it happen over the years mm -hmm. but in my business now, not that anybody's told me. <laughs> uh, no, nobody's told me any negative stuff, really. We've had some times where we probably shouldn't have done things quite as sketchy as we did. <laughs> well, it, it's very difficult uh, when you're dealing with trench boxes. There's always that gray area where um, in and out, yeah, in and out, yeah. like a miner, right? Somebody's got to go down there first to make the yeah, way clear sure and it's the same type of thing kind of we but generally everything's our bases are covered pretty well mm -hmm. i would say for anybody that doesn't know what that is yeah can you describe it a trench box yeah it's a engineered box steel box usually a six or an eight inch walls with spreader bars mm -hmm. which we decide on the opening of the width of uh what our cut's going to be into the ground and that has to go in the ground to hold the banks in place while we go down and put a manhole gotcha. pipe and so on and so forth. Safety and, would be, I mean, especially in a, in a season where it's wet. Well, that's what the you got to watch. Stable, right? The ground, right? Yeah. All, there's all different grounds, you know. Hmm. So some are really good, some are bad, some are sketchy. Mm -hmm. uh, vibration up above from the machines working mm -hmm. causes cave-ins. You got, usually the worst is the underground water coming in and that right. causes underground erosion that you don't see. So if yeah. it, if, if it's even a bit of a risk, we put a trench box in. You ever dig and you're like, oh my God, there's so much water here. What, what are we going to do? Oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> this time of the year is the worst. 
Really? Yeah, yeah. All the you, time. You get the melt off the thaw, it comes and goes. But our we have a couple very, uh, you know, hardened foremen who know what they're doing, and we have pumps ready to go. Everything's ready. Like, yeah. And we just start, you know. If you don't control the water, you might as well go home. Really? Yeah. That bad? You have to control the water. Do you have a hydrovac truck as well? No. No? I don't want one. No? <laughs> no. Uh, What's the difference? For they, those who don't well, know. they self-destruct. Yeah. They're just a gigantic vacuum cleaner sucking up rocks, right? Mm-hmm. So, but the biggest problem with them, I think, is dumping the material, getting rid of the product. That's a big thing right now. Yeah, yeah. And that, and vac trucks are worse than what we deal with, with just fill, right? Right. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we get back to the episode, don't forget to sign up to the VIP newsletter at thehighestandbestuse.com. You get great tips and tricks there, completely free. Also, don't forget to grab a copy of the book at thehighestandbestuse.com, Amazon Chapters, Barnes & Noble, all of these places. That's where you can get it. You can get it in paperback, ebook, hardcover edition, as well as the Audible version, too. So if you like to consume content by audio version, grab that. If you like paper, grab it there, too. And now back to the episode. Yeah. So what's changed? Legalities? permits, all of this. What's changed in the construction industry over the last few years? Well, one time we used to be able to go knock on a farmer's door and do you need a spot for fill? Oh yeah, I need fill and fill this low area. Mm-hmm. And generally you'd go and fill it and top sell it and make it look nice. Now, I think over the years, people, I'm going to blame Toronto contractors because they'll bring, they would have brought contaminated soils in from Toronto and started dumping down into the this area, which mm-hmm. was farm country, right? Right. And then we all get painted with the same brush. So now I don't deal with any fill off any site unless it's tested. Chemical analysis done on it. And then yeah. and then it has to go to a licensed facility now, which there isn't really any out there. So how does that affect the logistics? Like we talk, you and I talk about this a lot. How does that affect logistics? Because it drives me insane. Well, that's the problem. Like, Right now, we're trucking all the way to Mossport to a gravel pit. That's mm-hmm. the only licensed facility. Right. So they, they're they allowed to uh, put the rate at whatever they want. Mm. You know, to, to do a basement, which used to be 5000 bucks. now our bill, like our excavator for the day, could be $2,500 with the grade man, and hauling the fill away is $20,000. 20000 That's what it, That's exactly what the bills are right now. If From there's five 40, to if, twenty, if there's forty loads that come out of a basement, oh, generally, right. which it is, yeah, a nine foot cut, it's going to cost you eighteen to twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, because it's almost a hundred dollars for tippet, yeah. and then it's a two hour round trip, and trucking rates are one hundred twenty eight, hundred thirty bucks an hour now. So there's <laughs> two sixty plus another hundred, three hundred sixty four hundred bucks for each load. Oh my god! So forty loads, that's sixteen thousand dollars. And then you had the excavator. The excavator now, which used to be the big, big part, mm-hmm. is just a small part of the whole thing. <laughs> small potatoes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So how does that affect your overall pricing? I mean, you have to pass that down to the consumer. I have to price it that way. I, I give them a price uh, per load, basically. Right. And I basically say, if you can find your own spot, go ahead. Yeah. But if you can't, this is where we got to go. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Is it true that you can move fill from site to site if it's the same zoning? I've heard that. Yeah, but it has to be tested still. Still. Yeah, still has to be tested. Mm-hmm. Now, can you take, so if it's tested, mm-hmm. but it's not a licensed facility, you can't take dirt to a farm, for example? I don't know. I doubt it. Um, we okay. can take it to another, like if we deal with Biddles and Associates, let's say, we can, they'll have subdivisions going in or commercial buildings that need fill. Yeah. We're allowed to take it there, but it has mm-hmm. to be, have a chemical analysis done on it. Like for like? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So where's the most money made in construction right now? Not there. Not there. <laughs> the guy who has a dump site. Yeah. <laughs> um, you ever thought about buying your own dump site? And oh, getting yeah. It licensed? oh, yeah. But it, you can't. I've I've got a couple I'm working on now trying to get them licensed, but it's been year five and I'm still getting nowhere. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. What's the what's the constraint? And then we'll get back to the questions. It's We're the sidestepping It's the here. towns. Cl- Clarington's and stuff. Like, yeah, they're, hor- they're horrible to try to... Mm. They actually will, well, not just them. Any anybody actually comes out with a contract that we all bid on, that say you have to take the fill away uh, to a licensed facility. So mm-hmm. you can call there and say, "Can you give me a list of your licensed facilities?" And they go, "Oh, we don't have any." Well, where are we supposed to take the fill? You want us to take the? Well, that's your problem. 
So that's what's happening right now. Yeah. So it's going to take the industry time to, you know, the all the laws have changed for Phil, but they really don't have answers to help us figure out what to do with it. Hmm. So they want housing over here, yeah. which is one level of upper tier government. Yeah. But then boots on the ground is like, nah, we're not sure. Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of confusing. Yeah. Hmm. I've said for a while. Some of the things I'm even saying might not be correct, but right. that's what I'm seeing right now. I'm trying to deal with it. Well, I mean, uh, look, you got you got a pretty good sample size. Yeah, you got lots of staff. You're doing lots of volume. You're talking to all the right people, and you're saying, "I'm trying to do this legit." What what am I supposed to well, do? That's thing. We're I, we're one of the ones out there that we don't just truck it all over the place. I have it tested. I don't, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the only way around it now because I don't want to have problems, right? Like if right. you have to dig it up like on, in a farmer's field, I don't want to be dealing with that. Yeah. Mm, good yeah. point. I'd rather just stay above board. I think they can trace it. Oh, yeah. Let's they, say 20 people dump. Yeah. Can they be like, oh, yeah, that one six trucks ago, that's the problem load? Uh, no, probably not. No. But what they'll do is they'll go back to the, the owner of the property then and then it'll be, you know lawsuits and arrows flying all over the place i heard of a guy the blame one time. game he bought a call it a farm yeah and he was dumping illegal fill yeah and he collected the price per load whatever that was and he collected so much that the price per load was the money maker and the land was disposable he walked away from the dirt and kept the money income from yeah, the yeah that's the fill. what that's what a lot of st right back when that started happening yeah that's the kind of stuff that caused the problems right okay and then the government started especially the local governments but when you're local and you do local work and you work for them directly, you would hope for a little bit of some leniency. leeway. Yeah, right? help but, me out here. But you know, no, they treat us like we're Toronto. Right. You know, it's a dump truck. It's from Toronto. Well, yeah. no, no. <laughs> but that that's the way you're treated. So unfortunately, that's what's happened. But. So back to my initial before we got yeah. on a tangent. Where's the money made in construction right now? Where are the opportunities? Um, I guess it would be, you know, just tight ship making sure it's hard to say one thing or the other mm -hmm. um that's a good question sometimes i never know <laughs> uh, sometimes you don't even know if you make money when the phone uh, rings that's where you, you know, go <laughs> it's a vicious circle from bills go out bills come in you, yeah you get the if you if you keep watching it too close you go crazy i think so I, so then let's reverse productivity the is big yeah uh, productivity and you know running tight you got to run tight you, you can't have too many men you can't have too many machines and yeah especially the cost of fuel and stuff for repairs and everything else goes along with it where's the most money lost in construction um damage uh like underground damage utility damage mm. it gets expensive when you start hitting gas lines and stuff like that what does something like that cost let's say you rip up a fiber optic and you're like whoops Ooh. didn't know well, that could go from 30,000 to 300,000 fiber optic. Yeah, depends yeah, on yeah. the size of it, right? A normal gas repair, if we just hit a house service, a little wee quarter inch line, it's usually 6,000 6, bucks. Yep. Yeah. And Plus, if you, you hit get, like the Trans Canada, you're, you're hanging on. Just, yeah, you're done. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. No, uh, and then the problem is you're kind of labeled, right? They keep track of you. You're on a, like a point system. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. But we, we, we're pretty good. That's good. Yeah, we're pretty good. The cool. only one we hit last summer was one of the young guys put a shovel through it, hand shovel. <laughs> but you still get the same, really? same, same penalty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. They have that, to fix it, right? Because like conceivably. You're that, looking for it by shovel. That's right, which yeah. is, you know, what yeah. else do you do? If somebody has to fix it, and I guess you get the bill. Oh, man. Yeah. You can fight them, but nah. Sometimes it's not worth the hassle. It's not worth it sometimes. By the time yeah. you fight it, you could just go do another job. Yeah, you got lawyers and then your own time and everything. The stress yeah. of it is not for 5000 bucks. You just... It's a, <laughs> it's a line item. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> buying a pizza. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so how do you, as a business owner, define highest and best use of your time? Because obviously you want your business to be as profitable as possible, right, with this least amount of stress. So where do you focus your efforts to make that highest and best use? For me, it's organization. I, I dispatch the people... And then I'm, I'm pretty pretty involved in, um, once we get a job, I'm pretty involved in how the job goes, the timing, mm -hmm. your permits. Like, like that's the biggest hurdle to be able to move your men from one site to the next site to the next site without any blips. Mm. Like you can't take 12 guys, go, I don't know what to do tomorrow, go home. Yeah. You can't. You got to have everything organized ahead of them. And, yeah. How uh, far ahead do you work? Uh, usually between two weeks to a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah things pop up 
like that day, the morning of, uh, things change. That's my phone call. Hey, what are you doing like right now? Like, things send, change. Send a guy. <laughs> well, yeah. And then if you can juggle it around, you do. Yeah. That's, that's what we do anyway. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what helps us uh, with growth is we do anything. If, if a good customer calls, I bend over backwards to try to do what I can do to help them. But, sure. Well, I remember on the very first house that I built, yeah. I called you on a referral. Yeah. I said, hey, I'm looking for a basement to be dug, whack this house down, and, you know, this is my first time. Yeah. And I remember you came on site, and I told you that. I was like, look, uh, this is my first time. I've, I've, was I, that I don't, mean? Uh, uh, no. <laughs> I literally told you, look, Steve, I, I don't even know what I don't know. Mm. So, like, you know, I can kind of speak the language, but, you know, help me out here. Then you said, I promise you stick with me. I'll be fair, and I'll treat you right, and I'll give you 110%. Yeah. Right? And that's why I always stuck with you, because you were so genuine and true. Yeah. That, and like, yeah. I think that's why Straight a lot of shooter. customers yep. do that, right? right? Yeah. And all of my clients are like that. I get to know them on a personal level mm -hmm. and, uh, and I try not to lie to anybody ever. Right. Like yeah. if we can't get there, I'll tell you. And then if you want, I'll tell you where the guys are working, why we can't get there. <laughs> it's like, right. cause not every dig's the same. Not every dig, if you anticipate it to be, uh, two hours long or two days long, it could run into the next day. Sure. Um, cause you could hit muskeg, you could have problems, cave ins, water, mm -hmm. Uh, trucking issue like who knows but yeah you know, how but, do half loads affect you guys they must be a pain it is it's it's horrible yeah. yeah it's horrible and can you explain what a half load is half load is basically not a half load it's it's an axle weight mm. uh you're allowed five thousand tone per axle so if a triaxle has a triaxle dump truck which most people see in the road hauling gravel they get four axles the front the lift and the two tandems so that's five ten fifteen twenty ton Okay, then you have to take the tear weight of the vehicle off, which is the, the empty weight of the truck. Yep. And they might weigh 13.5. So all you have left is 6,500. Mm -hmm. That's all you can carry. Mm -hmm. That's why cement trucks have such a big issue. Their tear weight, some of those trucks are only tandems for one problem. They're not triaxles. Yeah. Well, there's both. Yeah. But let's say it's a triaxle, but they might weigh 18.5. So they can only carry a ton, a ton and a half. Which is nothing of concrete. Which they can't even. Like don't even come. That's why they don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. So would they just shut down during that period? Well, they normally don't shut down. They'll go where they can, but they won't go down certain roads, I think, unless they have literature, like a letter, mm. signed letter from the town or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think and they do if you have that. But And this is to protect the asphalt. Is that right? It's protect, yeah, because the frost and the... Like some places have already put the half loads in, in right now because mm -hmm. of the warm spell we had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And how bad is it? Because you drive through a place like Hamilton, for example, and all the steel trucks are, they're, they're kind of like logging trucks for metal, right? Yeah. They just destroy the roads. Mm -hmm. Like driving through yeah. Hamilton is a nightmare. Yeah. Is that same thing conceivably happening here? And that's why? It can. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. So let's talk about building the business. Yeah. Um, are you more focused on cash flow? Are you more focused on enterprise value? Uh, cash flow is important. Mm -hmm. Um, in our business, because we're the first ones to dig the hole or strip the field for a, a big, per, a big $5 million project going in, uh, we're the first ones there. We wait a long time to get paid. And then doing that, we have a lot of trucking and stuff like that. And I pay them all. I, uh, that's why I get them. If you don't pay them, you don't get them. And mm. so I, I keep a good rapport on paying my bills, but you're holding a lot of money. So it takes a, quite a few years to get going <clears throat> to be able to handle that type of weight for, you know. Sure. Some some customers are slower than the next. If I don't remember how slow you were, that's probably good. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if I think, oh, I remember you. <laughs> and then, then you got, then I, then it's usually not a good thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, because usually if the money's coming in from the clients, I don't hear about it. Mm -hmm. If if they call me in the office and say, "Hey, we're having trouble with this guy," and then I I start to to politely try to collect it, uh -huh. and then it starts to go from there. Right? And, you ever been in a sticky situation where you're like, oh. uh, "Yeah, sure." Not so much in my own business. I haven't I have a couple, but not nothing bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple thousand bucks here and there, but yeah nothing big mm -hmm. any of the big projects were usually covered because they're they're like a city project or uh, we go through a consultant firm and stuff like that so 
And when you say you have to wait to get paid, is that because the builders or developers don't pay out until they hit a certain milestone? Well, a lot financing? of home builders don't pay until they sell the house. Yeah. So that'd be tough to carry a project for a couple of years. Well, you don't carry it that long. You yeah. usually sometimes the worst is like 120 days. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, a house, you know, they they owe you five thousand bucks, which is nothing in the big picture, but you wait for that because mm -hmm. they they won't pay until the house is sold. Mm -hmm. Only some are like that. Yeah. yeah. And when would... you know who they are, you know you're getting paid still. It's not that they're not gonna pay you. A lot of those guys, they just mm -hmm. that's the way they operate. Mm -hmm. You just deal with it. Yeah. Do any of these companies sell on the open market? Do you know? As in what? Like construction companies. So if somebody said, I'm going to put my construction company up for sale, mm -hmm. excavation, sewer work, whatever it may be. Do they trade on the open market? Not that I know of. Uh, you get into the con drains and stuff like that, maybe. They're so huge. They're massive, right? Yeah, they're huge. And they own so much property and everything, right? How would they value those companies? <laughs> you know? Assets, I guess. Mm. Straight assets? I would think so. Or if they uh, invest at work ahead of them, mm -hmm. you know, sign contracts. So you're buying the book of deals. Yeah, you'd have to buy the signed contracts that are, you know, mm -hmm. but construction's hard. You don't have contracts for five years and, and you don't have contracts that you know coming up in two years that people have already signed on. You right. know, that doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 It's you bid, you get it. You have a, a site meeting and the way you go. Go do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> as long as all the permits are in place, the way you go. Right? It's kind of a one and done thing. Like once the basement's dug, that's it. Yeah. Like, like the the basement's, basement's a small part yeah. in any construction industry, really. It's not yeah. a big part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got the road, all the infrastructure for the basements is the biggest part. But True. That's why we kind of dabble in everything, which is kind of nice. So how do you identify what the best opportunity would be for your guys and your skill sets? Skill set's big, like uh, certain size subdivision, like site servicing. We try not to, if something have like over 100 houses on it, mm -hmm. we're probably not going to bid on it. It's too big for us. Mm -hmm. We could do it, but it's going to tie us up for the whole season. Yep. And then all my other good customers I've had for years, I'm going to have to say, oh, I can't get there. Can't come, yeah. Which is kind of a not a good thing to do. That's like an all your eggs in one basket type of situation. Yeah, that's right? what happens yeah. when, when you're a medium or small size company. If you take on a big job mm -hmm. that ties you up for two or three years, then it's all your eggs in one basket. And then what happens when that's done? All yeah. the customers you did have are gone somewhere else. Gone somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, so you try to just handle what you can handle, right? What's your opinion? Stay small or grow big? I, well, if you talked to me eight years ago, I was going to stay real small. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get any bigger. I think we're at a good size. Uh, we seem to show some profit and uh, everybody's happy and I can kind of control it. Yeah. If it gets too big, then you get into more management and mm -hmm. more wages for management. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's hard. But And then you lose, as an owner, you might lose a bit of control of what's going on more. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, as an owner, you only uh, you only get told what they want to tell you. <laughs> the workers, management, your coworkers, whatever, you only hear what they, they want you to hear. <laughs> you don't hear everything unless you have your ear, ear, ear of the wall, right? But, you ever been but, in those situations where you're like, I know what's really going on here. Oh, I've, yeah. I've been around enough to know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like even the, the younger guys, I'll say step up, try doing that without somebody telling you what to do. Oh, I'm afraid to make a mistake. You know, like, and then you got to explain to them, they're not going to make a big enough mistake to cost yeah. the business. Yeah kill somebody, mm -hmm. anything like that. So any little bit of mistake they make, it's a learning curve for them, and it's not a big deal for me. Yeah. They got to step up. Like people yeah. have to, you have to clip their wings and let them go a bit. Clip their wings. You have to do something. Fly, birdie, fly. <laughs> if you micromanage them, they're not going to learn anything. I remember, mm -hmm. I, I think you guys dug a hole for me one time, and somebody had over dug the hole, right? And somebody was learning or something like that. And they were a little bit distraught about what happened because they yep. overdug the hole, which means the footings are too low and you got to yep. fix the footings, right? Yeah. But like, really, at the end of the day, it wasn't, it was an extra meter of concrete or something. Yeah. Like, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. And it was an easy fix, but somebody will learn intuitively for the next time. Yep. Maybe I shouldn't do that or maybe I should pay more attention or maybe I should follow the survey stakes or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how you learn. Yeah. You, you have to give these guys a chance. And then in a situation like that, I would have to discuss with you and maybe pay the extra mm -hmm. concrete, whatever, and you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of scaling a labor-based business, mm -hmm. if you want to do more sales, you have to hire more people. More people come with more cost. More sales come with more administration. Right. 
How do you weigh the pros and cons there as a business owner? Well, like you're right. Like if you get more people, you got to have more work. And when you hire somebody on, you're basically hiring their whole family. Like right. you're, you're, you're committing yourself to another family to feed, really. Um, and when you're a bigger organization, it would be more like a numbered person. Mm -hmm. You don't need them, you throw them off to the side. But it, it's hard to do it like that in my size of business. So you have to kind of manage your workload to your staff. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, but every year that kind of flips the wrong way where you're not enough staff, too much work. Mm -hmm. Which and is that, a good problem to have. It's a good problem, but the only reason that usually happens is because nothing goes when it's supposed to go. You'll land all this work and it's supposed to go this month, that month, six months from now, and then nothing goes all summer. And then right. two months before Christmas, you do a whole year's work in two months. Yeah. And everybody wants everything paved and, and you know, the paving companies and the curb companies, they're all run off their feet. And I call it the Christmas spirit. Where we, all, <laughs> we all get grumpy. We all yelling at each other, contractors back and forth. And then Christmas comes, it's all said and done, and we all just, oh. Deep it's breath. done. Yep. Yeah. Everybody did a great job in the way you go. But, yeah. What are some of the biggest opportunities that can come from a scenario like that? Opportunities? Yeah. Well, if if you do have time to fit in other projects, the pricing could be higher because mm -hmm. you do start to price higher. Uh, I'd like to say we do, and I think everybody does because you see the numbers change. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the spring, in the fall, in the winter, uh, numbers change yeah. because everybody's busy. But if you get that job for this money, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, what about what about margin? So as you scale, margin changes substantially, right? Now all of a sudden, like when you're like a one man band, it was you and another guy running around with a rubber tire bobcat or whatever yeah, you had, yeah. right? Like, <clears throat> you know, you could clearly see, okay, my fuel cost was this, you know, my my hourly wage is this, and I'm paying for the machine. That's pretty much it, plus some overhead. Yeah. But then when you grow it into an organization, things substantially change. Yeah, you have to. Um, keep track of everything the biggest the biggest problem is uh, billing invoicing and then making sure the money comes in after it's invoiced um that that's probably the hardest part is invoicing making sure things get invoiced um trying not to invoice see a plumber can come in they invoice you for a, a nut a washer hmm. Anything, yeah. a cotter pin. They invoice you for everything. Everything is itemized. We don't get away with that. It's just, so a lot of things we do is kind of either hidden the cost or you don't feel that it happened. <laughs> it happened and you didn't even know. When you say you don't get away with it, what do you mean? Like well, it's... we can't bill every little thing we do. Like if we bring a cutoff saw to your house, mm -hmm. we don't bill a cutoff saw right. typically. You know, When you work for the cities or regions, those things are itemized then. But when it's... Uh, a commercial builder or a big contract, you don't want to, that's an extra, this is an extra, this is an extra, mm. you know, you can do that and probably get paid once, yep. but the odds are them using you again isn't, isn't going to be good. Really? Yeah. So that's different than residential. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Cause it's extras, right? They yeah. think the money the job's going to cost this. Now you're going to nail them for all kinds of things. Hmm. If it isn't blatantly obvious, you got to be careful. So it should really be worked. Like th there's just an expectation in the commercial space. You just have this stuff. Yep. You, just you have, have to have everything. They, when the, you get hired, they expect you to come with everything, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Which it makes it easy for you, I guess, in a sense, because you can say, okay, this is my price. Yep. Generally, you're not saying, okay, did you, where's the receipt for Home Depot for the so-and-so? No, you know? none of that. Yeah. Did you buy a pack of cutoff wheels? Did you buy whatever? Like, like we bury a skid of two by fours in the ground when you put in the services, right? In the subdivision. Really? They're buried right in the ground. <laughs> you don't. You don't cover that. Like that's got gone, right? Where do they go? What do you mean? Where they're buried? Well, they're markers, right? To mark where the stubs are in the ground. And yeah. then when the next guy's coming to hook up, he digs down, finds the wooden stakes, and he knows at the bottom mm -hmm. there's the gold. Yeah. 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 Well, it's funny. That's where you hook onto. Yeah. That's where the gold is. But the two by four is now considered the gold because the lumber is so friggin' expensive. Yep. Things have changed. It used to be three bucks. And now it's yeah. Wipe it off. And, reuse it. And it's come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, it gets crushed up usually. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Exit strategy. Yeah. So you've come from employment to now employer. Yep. At some point, you're going to say, you know what? I'm good. I'm done. I don't want to work anymore or my priorities have changed. What does that look like for you? I'm there now. Um, but my priorities aren't maybe to leave. 
Uh, I don't know what I'll do with myself totally. I'd like to slow down a bit, but I have a son and a son-in-law that um, we're grooming right now to take over. And then I would kind of still be in the background mm-hmm. and draw a wage and mm-hmm. and kind of, you know. An advisory role. <laughs> you, you can't have them buy it because they can't afford it. Right. So just let them run it and just give me my wage and mm-hmm. and I'll help you out still. But That's your you piece. Know, if I have to go drive a truck or run a machine, that, that'll be that'll be nice. Take my lunch pail to work and, and go home, you know. But, yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things, especially um, – me being a a customer of you, that's one of the things that I noticed over the years is that I think a lot of people respect you, A, because you're very, you you know, kind and candid and genuine. And the fact that you're not just sitting in an office controlling or calling the shots, like you're actually out there and you're saying, hey, look, I can do this too. And because I can do it, this is how I think you should do it. And this is why you should listen to me. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. Yeah, I didn't realize that. But yeah, it's true because, you know, yeah, yes, I can do probably everything everybody can do. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say I'm going to be better than everybody, but mm-hmm. I can get by and, mm-hmm. and I can do it. And I know if try, somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes, you know, with a <laughs> client or a worker, you know, you, you've been around long enough. You've seen pretty much everything, I would like to say. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to uh, in build into the kids is that you need to know how to do everything. Mm-hmm. Because when they phone you, Hey, I don't know what to do. You got to come here. The grades are messed up. You got to be able to go and know how to answer the question. That's you right. can't say, I don't know what to do. I guess we have to just quit. You know, <laughs> you know we, we're going to have to just go home. home. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. you, you have to know what to do yeah. or who to call or who to get help from. or you, And you can't you, you can't have the uh, pride. You have to be able to call people for help if you need it, like other yeah. friends or other business owners. We talk if we have to. Mm-hmm. And talk things out and figure it out. Because sometimes some things do pop up where uh, Joe Blow did that job before. He's had that happen. I haven't. So you talk to him. Yeah. yeah. Is it a competitive space? Um, yes and no. I, I don't think, um, I would say we all kind of know, stay away from each other a bit. Mm-hmm. And if you get the job, so well, good for you. You got the job. Yeah. We'll see you in the next if one. you need something, give me a shout. You yeah. know, uh, the Toronto guys come in and pull some stupid numbers every once in a while, mm. and then they're gone. And then we have to go in, like the the home builder will call and say, they're not coming back to do the frame and covers in the subdivision. Uh, they've got leaks, and but they won't come back. Can you come do it? Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, you just give me the job in the first to place. To begin with, yeah. yeah. But, you know, that happens a lot. But Yeah. yeah but that's yeah. the way it is, I guess. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. It's been really fun. Thank yeah. you for being here. I mean, yeah. from this side of the mic, just to see A, you in studio and be, you know, <laughs> and be present to take some time away from what you're doing, but B, to come here and, and share your insights uh, with what's happening in the industry, the behind the scenes of a construction business, all of this. Uh, and again, you know, you're, you're so kind and gracious to be yeah. doing this. So yeah, uh, for me to you, thank you very much <laughs> for being blush. here. <laughs> yeah. where, where can people find out more about you? Uh, well, my, you can go on our, uh, our website, Needs Work. But uh, Bros Excavating, um, my number is 905-261-3174. I keep my phone on all the time because we do emergency repairs for, you know, uh, the region, the school boards, the Catholic school boards, whoever, I guess. Mm-hmm. So if we're available, we go fix stuff. But, awesome. Um, yeah, no. And we're online, I guess. You can catch us online. And Beautiful. We have signs all over the place. But, yeah. All right. If our truck breaks your window, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it, Steve Bro. Thanks for tuning into the Highest and Best Use Real Estate Podcast. Don't forget to sign up to the book at thehighestandbestuse.com. I'm your host, Ryan Carr, reminding you that good deals are found, great deals are created. Like, share, follow, and subscribe, and we will see you on the next episode.